to what extent do you think um, that the Christ story has been shaped by conscious appropriation of, of other myths like the Mithras uh, story and the Zoroastrianism and, and so on? And to what extent is it uh, shaped by a collective unconscious that always puts out the same basic stories? I think a key thing to this, um, when people start to talk about the psychological aspects and the um, the narratives, it feels like you're beginning to undermine the reality of stories like Christ or the the Archon presence on Earth. And it feels like you're beginning to weave them into a psychological, subconscious, unconscious conjuration. That is not the case. It's very important to understand the mechanism of archetypes because at the root of this not necessarily in the pure Jungian sense but at the root of the arch the, the concept of the archetype is the idea that there is no distinct separation between self and non-self and on an energetic level there is no separation between one thing and another thing there are no things there are only forms that appear manifest and disappear so what we have with an archetype is probably what is more conceivable as what Rupert Sheldrake formulates as a morphogenetic field a habit pattern a place to hang your coat on a space in which you can color because the lines are already drawn in and all you have to do is fill them in with your favorite colors that pattern when given life and energy and consciousness over and over and over develops its own life, its own existence and just as a plant knows what to do as it grows it's able to mimic the successful behavior of its predecessors but it's also able to adapt and to change and Sheldrake says that that thing is is kind of carried throughout the field of existence in a kind of holographic sense it permeates everything it's there all the time and these things can communicate with each other at kind of instantaneously at kind of a quantum level and similarly if we see that uh, an archetypal figure like that of Christ shares these characteristics we can say well yes because essentially that conjuration of form is brought into being by nothing other than consciousness and if there is no separation between one piece of consciousness and another at the very basic level, the no separation, then of course there is. There is only one imagining of this thing, and it would be the consensus imagining. And this is this is what reveals the profound nature of the imagination to us, which is a uh, becoming increasingly a cornerstone of my work and I'm currently involved in a project to kind of put a film together for this. I'm going to be over in your neck of the woods in December, actually. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that offline. You never know. I might be up near your way. I might be able to buy you a drink or something. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That'd be cool. Uh, anyway, um, the imagination, uh, and I spoke about this at the conference we discussed earlier, the imagination is the thing that holographically creates the world around us. And with that imagination, you can either keep running the same code over and over, that's a chair, that's a cloud, that's a tree, that's a glass of water, or you can break it and hack it and do something else, do something totally different, completely up to you. But because we're so entrenched in belief and we're so entrenched in this really entrained pattern of thinking, our imagination is disempowered and it becomes really just a conduit for something else so if a billion people watch Roland Emmerich's new 2012 film and associate 2012 with a disastrous scenario and the end of life then that has a profound effect on the collective consensus reality tunnel that most people reside in so far from being harmless entertainment and just a bit of fun it's a deep piece of sorcery a very very profound a very profound what's the right word um, inscription into that conscious imprint in every person and it becomes hammered into the stone it's very difficult to get that out 
So it's like a fear response. If a lion roars at you, you're going to feel fear in your veins. And it takes a long time before you can rewire that response. Similarly, if you associate something in your brain very powerfully with an emotive response, this incredible CGI we see nowadays, where the waves crash through the city streets and the snow consumes the uh, Statue of Liberty or whatever, as we see these things, they are real. They are real as far as the eye can see. There's no distinction anymore. It's not like the crappy old 70s effects. They're indistinguishable now. And when we see that, that emotive response creates a very, very distinct neural pathway in the brain, which I again touched on in my uh, talk at the conference. It creates a pathway in the brain. The neurons, once they repeat that and they are infused with this hormone response, that then becomes a circuit. That then becomes a pathway that will be run and rerun and rerun over and over. And so if you want to create a reality where there is an alien invasion with a bit of fakery and a bit of blue beam holography thrown in just for a bit of real world, real time CGI, then the secret of that is prepping the mindset for the appropriate emotive response. And when that happens, the imagination that people have already created is consent for that reality to manifest. So that reality has already happened in cinemas and has already happened in people's minds and in their dreams and in their subconscious wanderings. It's already there. It already exists. To switch that from entertainment and personal, intimate experience to actual felt experience on a consensus level is a very small step, very small step. So sequestering the imagination is the biggest battle that one has to face and it's the easiest one to overcome because all you do is you choose very carefully what you put into your brain you choose very carefully what you decide to feed to your friends and your family and those who you love and there is a certain fail safe in that if you do anything with consciousness then you diminish any negative effects of it so if a conscious person goes in knowing about the universe to a healthy degree, you don't have to be a master, just somebody who's aware of the basic mechanics of existence, goes and sits in that theater and watches that film, they are less affected by it. Still affected, but less affected. But those who are entirely unconscious and walk around as total sleepwalkers, they are powerfully funneling this reality suggested by, let's say, the dark sorcerers, the archons, whatever, they need a certain frequency of consciousness which looks a lot like fear. It's not quite fear, but it's, it's very similar. Fear elicits it, I would say. They need that. And so the best way to do it is to create these powerfully resonant events like 9-11, like a big movie. It's the same thing to them. So they are rituals, and they are rituals which bring about a certain flavor of consciousness. That's what they're for. So very important to understand why the imagination is probably the most precious thing we have in this galaxy and humans have it because we have the lineage back to source the pathway back to source we cannot be destroyed the body can be dispensed with instantly of course but that consciousness that lineage is indestructible so the value of our consciousness is not only in the little heads that momentarily reflect it but in its extraordinary multidimensional power which we know nothing about whatsoever so that's the magnitude of the problem we face and the sorcerers and the shamans and the wizards and the druids and all the people who have scratched away at this and realized that this has been going on operate necessarily in secret or necessarily with complete covert operations from moment to moment and occasionally when they gain public acceptance or public visibility and it works if the system spots them as a, a problem they'll eliminate them completely so when the Romans came to Britain the first thing they did was exterminate all the Druids because the Druids were the indigenous shamans of England they exterminated all of them and drove them out into from the south from the Midlands over into what is now known as Wales here over to Anglesey 
uh, to virtually an island space where the Druids are still said to exist in uh, another form or in you know splinter splinter cells now, but that that was driven out because it was a, a threat not only to the the Roman might and the Roman uh, sequestering of the popular culture, but also at the higher energy level, those were the guys who were teaching every piece of consciousness, every human, every animal, every tree that they came into contact with, that were all existing, not just here as physical pieces of meat walking around and sweating and pulsating, but as dimensional beings in this ever infinite nested reality structure. So what we do here affects the unfolded 4D space. Our enfoldment in the 4D space affects the 5D space. So every time you go up into a higher dimensional vibration, that 5D space encompasses everything beneath it. So we cannot see up there, but they can see us. They're here now. It's just that they're at a different frequency, just like a radio station. So it is a big picture. So everything to do with Christ, to do with UFOs, to do with this co cosmic kind of consciousness, to create um, new thoughts and new paradigms is all interrelated with this. So the necessary consciousness required to perceive it and to make life better and more rich is is an inherent shamanic ability and when I use the word shamanic I mean in the sense of someone who is able to move between different dimensional spaces serve their own gnosis but more importantly to serve as in the traditional shamanic sense to serve the community that they're part of to share it with their friends their family and now with these communities that we have which are virtual like the community you've created so we are sharing this gnosis for people to look at they don't need to believe it. They don't need to have faith in it. They just need to look at it. They need to look at it and examine not just the brain, but with the heart, the validity of this. These inorganic beings that are putting forward memes like Blue Beam or this new movie about 2012, it seems to me that there there's a risk involved in that. Like, if, for instance, if the Blue Beam conspiracy were to happen. That could be an event that would s severely disrupt the everyday grind and the everyday grid that we're in that they seem to feed off of. That it would, could cause quite a lot of people to wake up on some level or another. I mean, t just the notion that there are real alien beings uh, from other civilizations, I would think would be a dis profoundly disruptive notion to the, the everyday grind that we're in that 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 the inorganic beings are are feeding off of and the same thing with 9-11 i mean uh jake Kotze talks about 9-11 as a stargate and yet it was also used to create a situation where people were more suppressed in their imaginative abilities so how how is that working out i mean isn't there always a risk with one of these psyop operations um i think the risks are very very carefully calculated. They're, they're risks that are so well envisioned that they're virtually 0% of anything going wrong. So there are many layers to this. So if we take 9-11, for example, 9-11 is a nice example of the revelation of the method principle, which in its most um, fundamental form is a technique of trauma programming, whereby the, this kind of... Um, uh, the dominance of the programmer, the, the controller over the subject is um, amplified through the disclosure of their own control. So they show you what they're doing to you and this increases the submission by showing the unconscious um, how profoundly um, affected you are by how they control you. And there's nothing you can do about it and you consent to it. So you continue to give your power to this to this machine. So everybody in the heart knows that 9-11 stinks. Everybody knows that. And yet nobody does anything because they're not sure where to begin and they don't believe in the power of their own consciousness to do something about it. Just like an assassination that was clearly um, 
you know, the JFK thing, everybody knows that was wrong, but it doesn't really make any difference because nobody cares and it was a long time ago and everybody knows the government is corrupt. Everybody knows the government is corrupt and what do they do about it? Nothing. So it works on many levels, this, but if we take um, the alien scenario and the blue beam scenario as an example as, as, and to answer your question, if you consider that any form of advanced life, real advanced life, that was going to come to visit the Earth and has a connection to the source, i.e. is a real ensouled entity, a real conscious organic entity, that presence on this planet would present a huge problem to any controllers, human or non-human. Okay? So anything that came here of that nature would be a problem any kind of dimensional shift that empowered conscious beings would be a big problem. So using the same technique that we did before, what we're seeing now, and, and people who are really penetrating this issue, you can see it right now, today, everywhere, on the TV, in the streets, everywhere. They're sequestering not only the shift, but they're also sequestering visitation as well. So if real non-human advanced intelligence, extra dimensional or whatever comes to visit, it means a serious diminishment for these controlling uh, entities, as I say, whether, whether we call them flyers, archons, uh, the human puppets like the Dick Cheney's and the Gordon Brown's and the Tony Blair's and the Putin's of this world all sit around the same table at the top of the pyramid, all of them. Um, so the only chance for the, these dark forces who use us and need us as a power source is to divert everybody's attention onto the lowest density, the lowest density 3D dwellers, the least conscious, the most fearful, the most belief oriented people. So it would in fact be desirable to depict any and all outside visitors as invaders or even biblical demons, religious demons. And Bluebeam is the means to achieve this. So one thing's for sure, as, as this polarization of consciousness deepens, it is the real sense that we, we do approach the end of an age, but it's the end of an age as in the sense that we see autumn as the end of a season, the beginning of another. It's the prelude to something else. If you were a leaf on a tree and you've only ever known winter, life looks pretty grim, right? If you're a leaf on a tree in summer, life is wonderful. Life is wonderful. It's full of sun. It's full of creatures. It's full of wonderful sounds. It's full of happiness and laughter. If you know all the seasons, you begin to get this better balance of the whole cycle and what it means. So as this polarization continues, you can see, you can feel it. If you really listen and really look, you can see it and feel it. It's a sign that this shift is real. It's not something that occurs on a specific date in 2012. It's occurring now. 2012 is just the top of the curve of the graph, you know? So the best advice really is to maintain a kind of real pristine balance of open-mindedness, um, critical judgment, and a, a knowing, a spiritual knowing. And, and no, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or you you're into consciousness or you're into Mormonism, it doesn't matter. No God, no spiritual entity worth his salt, worth her salt, whatever, is jealous or cruel. It doesn't work like that. A an entity wants the people to grow, to learn, to expand, transcend and come home. That's, that's the game. That's what it's all about, to follow the heart and use that to get there. So anything that interferes with that is not from source. So wherever you see that level of destruction or deception, it's not from source. So any invaders, as far as I'm concerned, are fake. You don't get space invaders. It doesn't work like that. It's fake. It's fake. So only those with no lineage, with no path home, it's either pure fakery, i.e. real-world CGI right there in the skies above us, which they can do and have proved over and over, or it's a level of entity who do not have that path home and have to rely on technology for their continued existence, which is probably, probably being the operative word, what we see with the greys, because they are not organic beings for, 
you know the accounts that I've read on the internet and having had the opportunity to speak to people who have had contact with them and have spent their lives devoted to research this stuff um, that's what we see and these beings are described in 1800 year old Gnostic uh, scriptures exactly the same things as lower archontic beings what we now call greys and they're knackered they're stuffed as we say in England <laughs> they're in a really difficult position so they need technology and uh, that's the way they they go uh, we're in a much better position not only can we not be destroyed not only are we eternal but our path is much longer much healthier much more wonderful divine um, so this interruption is brief and is temporary um, so it's just part of the discipline it's part of the process um, but in that sense there is no risk whatsoever involved to these people because they have to do it they are close to the end of their game so what we would say as polarized human beings right now what would what we would see as wickedness or darkness which I do not accept and acknowledge on a higher level it doesn't make any sense but what it feels like that those people who have chosen to live their life in that unconscious way and those entities who are forced to do that because that's the only way they can survive their days are numbered essentially and everybody who's alive now is going to see the effects of that and what that looks like and what that feels like so to be who you are what you really are inside and to just be is the most powerful thing you can do and not have your reactions programmed and not have your imagination suggested and spoon fed to you on a daily basis is one of the most rebellious guerrilla tactics you can possibly do is to be yourself and to love the people around you and to look at the trees and to look at the sky to appreciate what's around to learn to grow all the good stuff and not really consume any of the messaging that comes out of the screens so it's extremely important that otherwise you develop these kind of concrete shoes and you cannot lift off, you can't move, you can't walk quickly, there's no fluidity in what you do. So to cast those off, to dissolve them, the consciousness has to generate this supreme fineness, this kind of granularity where you can really move through everything and nothing's going to blow you over. Whereas if you're walking around with this huge, heavy, rigid, dense form full of abstract intellectual theories, you, you're going to have a problem when these things begin to change the physical nature of the planet. So in my book, to summarize that little thought process, that little piece of my reality tunnel, I would say that naturally we are multidimensional ascendant beings. All of us, that's what we do, that's what we are. That process has just been temporarily interrupted and to resume normal service, to get back on track what we do is be who we really are and there are lots of ways and techniques and manner of uh, technologies organic and otherwise to achieve that but it's there it's there it's not that difficult the most difficult thing is to break out of the construct because it feels like what you should be doing and everyone else is doing it so that's the tricky bit mm -hmm. yeah um well it is a tricky bit, and and uh, you know, we'll, I continue to work on it in my own way and in, in my own reality tunnel. Um, but it was great uh, talking to you uh, today, and I look forward to editing this together. Um, yeah, no, it's been great. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, I guess the, the last question I have is um, about time, because uh, we're going to probably be airing this on um, uh, December. I'll be putting airing it. I'll be putting it on the internet on uh, December thirtieth, probably the the second half. I figure. So do you have anything to say about this idea of, of the quickening as we come into a new year? Yeah. I, think I think what we see as the dimensional spaces overlap, as the 4D moves into the 3D, time appears to be speeding up. Whereas in actual fact, what is occurring is time has ceased to provide the function that it once did. It's no longer necessary. So time is actually disappearing and as it slides out like a rug from under our feet, everything seems to move so much faster. And we can't seem to keep up with everything because it's being extracted from this layer 
of our being. It's no longer relevant anymore. So time gets faster and faster and faster. And what we must learn to do is understand that that also is a natural part of the progression from a completely third-dimensional existence to a more fulfilled and holistic fourth-dimensional existence, which encompasses that. So time no longer necessary, time disappears. Yes, the effect is that it appears to hasten. It appears, it appears that there is a quickening. And that actually is consciousness moving from a space of density to a space of less density. Like air pressure moves and creates wind, this rush that we see through us is our own consciousness wishing to move to a higher dimensional space, to more intricately and beautifully expressed platform to exist as consciousness. Because this place is becoming redundant. It's no longer necessary. Just like a chrysalis and the butterfly has already flown away, the chrysalis dissolves. So let us not become too attached to our chrysalis. Okay, that sounds great. And I'll, I'll try to think of that when I see the the ball drop um, uh, at the end of the year here. <laughs> Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, well it's a good thing. It's a good it's all it's all organic. It's all natural. What uh, what else could there be than natural? Yeah. You're going to feel fear in your veins and it takes a long time before you can rewire that response. Similarly, if you associate something in your brain very powerfully with an emotive response, this incredible CGI we see nowadays where the waves crash through the city streets and the snow consumes the uh, Statue of Liberty or whatever. As we see these things, they are real. They are real as far as the eye can see. There's no distinction anymore. It's not like the crappy old 70s effects. They're indistinguishable now. And when we see that, that emotive response creates a very, very distinct neural pathway in the brain, which I again touched on in my uh, talk at the conference. It creates a pathway in the brain. The neurons... Once they repeat that and they are infused with this hormone response, that then becomes a circuit. That then becomes a pathway that will be run and rerun and rerun over and over. And so if you want to create a reality where there is an alien invasion with a bit of fakery and a bit of blue beam holography thrown in just for a bit of real world, real time CGI, then the secret of that is prepping the mindset for the appropriate emotive response. And when that happens, the imagination that people have already created is consent for that reality to manifest. So that reality has already happened in cinemas and has already happened in people's minds and in their dreams and in their subconscious wanderings. It's already there, it already exists. To switch that from entertainment and personal, intimate, experience to actual felt experience on a consensus level is a very small step very small step so sequestering the imagination is the biggest battle that one has to face and it's the easiest one to overcome because all you do is you choose very carefully what you put into your brain you choose very carefully what you decide to feed to your friends and your family and those who you love and there is a certain fail-safe in that if you do anything with consciousness, then you diminish any negative effects of it. So if a conscious person goes in knowing about the universe to a healthy degree, you don't have to be a master. To what extent do you think um, that the Christ story has been shaped by conscious appropriation of, of other myths like the Mithras uh, story and the Zoroastrianism and, and so on, and to what extent is it uh, shaped by a collective unconscious that always puts out the same basic stories? I think a key thing to this, um, when people start to talk about the psychological aspects and the um, the narratives, it feels like you're beginning to undermine the reality of stories like Christ or the the Archon presence on earth and it feels like you're beginning to weave them into a psychological subconscious unconscious conjuration that is not the case it's very important to understand the mechanism of archetypes because at the root of this not necessarily in the pure jungian sense but at the root of the arch the, 
the concept of the archetype is the idea that there is no distinct separation between self and non-self. And on an energetic level, there is no separation between one thing and another thing. There are no things. There are only forms that appear, manifest, and disappear. So what we have with an archetype is probably what is more conceivable as what Rupert Sheldrake formulates as a morphogenetic field, a habit pattern, a place to hang your coat on, a space in which you can colour because the lines are already drawn in and all you have to do is fill them in with your favourite colours. That pattern when given life and energy and consciousness over and over and over, develops its own life, its own existence. And just as a plant knows what to do as it grows, it's able to mimic the successful behavior of its predecessors, but it's also able to adapt and to change. And Sheldrake says that that thing is, is kind of carried throughout the field of existence in a kind of holographic sense, it permeates everything. It's there all the time. And these things can communicate with each other at kind of instantaneously, at kind of a quantum level in uh, another form or, in, you know, splinter, splinter cells now. But that, that was driven out because it was a, a threat, not only to the, the Roman might and the Roman uh, sequestering of the popular culture, but also at the higher energy level, those were the guys who were teaching every piece of consciousness, every human, every animal, every tree that they came into contact with, that were all existing, not just here as physical pieces of meat walking around and sweating and pulsating, but as dimensional beings in this ever-infinite nested reality structure. So what we do here affects the enfolded 4D space. Our enfoldment in the 4D space affects the 5D space. So every time you go up into a higher dimensional vibration, that 5D space encompasses everything beneath it. So we cannot see up there, but they can see us. They're here now. It's just that they're at a different frequency, just like a radio station. So it is a big picture. So everything to do with Christ, to do with UFOs, to do with this co cosmic kind of consciousness, to create... Um, new thoughts and new paradigms is all interrelated with this. So the necessary consciousness required to perceive it and to make life better and more rich is, is an inherent shamanic ability. And when I use the word shamanic, I mean in the sense of someone who is able to move between different dimensional spaces, serve their own gnosis, but more importantly to serve, as in the traditional shamanic sense, to serve the community that they're part of to share it with their friends, their family, and now with these communities that we have, which are virtual, like the community you've created. So we are sharing this gnosis for people to look at. They don't need to believe it. They don't need to have faith in it. They just need to look at it. They need to look at it and examine not just the brain, but with the heart, the validity of this. These inorganic beings that are putting forward memes like Blue Beam or this new movie about 2012, it seems to me that there there's a risk involved in that. Like, if, for instance, if the Blue Beam conspiracy were to happen, that could be an event that would s severely disrupt... And similarly, if we see that uh, an archetypal figure like that of Christ shares these characteristics, we can say, well, yes, because essentially that conjuration of form is brought into being by nothing other than consciousness and if there is no separation between one piece of consciousness and another at the very basic level the no separation then of course there is there is only one imagining of this thing and it would be the consensus imagining and this is this is what reveals the profound nature of the imagination to us which is a becoming increasingly a cornerstone of my work and I'm currently involved in a project to kind of put a film together for this. I'm going to be over in your neck of the woods in December, actually. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that offline. You never know. I might be up near your way. I might be able to buy you a drink or something. Who knows? Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. That'd be cool. Uh, anyway, um, the imagination, uh, and I spoke about this at the conference we discussed earlier, the imagination is the thing that holographically creates the world around us. And with that imagination, you can either keep running the same code over and over, that's a chair, that's a cloud, that's a tree, that's a glass of water, or you can break it and hack it and do something else, do something totally different, completely up to you. But because we're so entrenched in belief and we're so entrenched in this really entrained pattern of thinking, our imagination is disempowered and it becomes really just a conduit for something else. So if a billion people watch Roland Emmerich's new 2012 film and associate 2012 with a disastrous scenario and the end of life, then that has a profound effect on the collective consensus reality tunnel that most people reside in. So far from being harmless entertainment and just a bit of fun, it's a deep piece of sorcery, a very, very profound, a very profound the right word um, inscription into that conscious imprint in every person and it becomes hammered into the stone it's very difficult to get that out so it's like a fear response if a lion roars at you, just somebody who's aware of the basic mechanics of existence goes and sits in that theater and watches that film they are less affected by it still affected but less affected but those who are entirely unconscious and walk around as total sleepwalkers they are powerfully funneling this reality suggested by let's say the dark sorcerers the archons whatever they need a certain frequency of consciousness which looks a lot like fear it's not quite fear but it's, it's very similar fear elicits it i would say they need that and so the best way to do it is to create these powerfully resonant events like 9 11 like a big movie it's the same thing to them so they are rituals, and they are rituals which bring about a certain flavor of consciousness. That's what they're for. So very important to understand why the imagination is probably the most precious thing we have in this galaxy. And humans have it because we have the lineage back to source, the pathway back to source. We cannot be destroyed. The body can be dispensed with instantly, of course. But that consciousness, that lineage is indestructible. So the value of our consciousness is not only in the little heads that momentarily reflect it, but in its extraordinary multidimensional power, which we know nothing about whatsoever. So that's the magnitude of the problem we face. And the sorcerers and the shamans and the wizards and the druids and all the people who have scratched away at this and realized that this has been going on, operate necessarily in secret or necessarily with complete covert operations from moment to moment and occasionally when they gain public acceptance or public visibility and it works if the system spots them as a a problem they'll eliminate them completely so when the romans came to britain the first thing they did was exterminate all the druids because the druids were the indigenous shamans of england they exterminated all of them and drove them out into from the south, from the Midlands, over into what is now known as Wales here, over to Anglesey, uh, to virtually an island space where the Druids are still said to exist.